And it's uh, an honor to be back. Uh, this is me in 2019 here at DevOps Days DC giving a, a talk about um, the relatively new launch. Uh, uh, we mostly talked about reliability. I'll try and do a different, different twist on it this year. Um, uh, but uh, I did, uh, did want to do kind of a little bit of a warm up. Um, we'll do a bit of a you know, a bit of a game. If, uh, if anybody knows where these places are, just kind of shout out uh, the answer. And um, just curious. Anybody know where this might be? No, quite, quite. There you go. Glacier, yeah. This one's probably more popular. Anyone know this one? Bryce, yeah, you're in? Denali, OK. So some aficionados, awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, they're, they're, these are, these, those are the easy ones. There's a lot more. There's hundreds. <laughs> um, all right, so really quickly, for those who didn't raise their hand, uh, what is Rec.gov? Um, you can think of it as kind of a two faces of a coin. Um, so on the external side, um, that's what we like to call the customer-centric one-stop shop. Uh, this is the stuff that we get to see as uh, you know, normal people. Uh, they just want to go camping and uh, hang out outside. Um, so Rec.gov provides a single access point for all of us to uh, access. It's right around 4,500 different locations and 120,000 uh, what we call recreational assets or you know, things that you can participate in. Um, so this is stuff like camping at Yosemite, backpacking in the Grand Canyon, tickets to the Washington Monument, agency passes, if you want a permit to chop down a Christmas tree, if you want to attend the annual White House Easter egg hunt or do the Christmas tree lighting, um, we kind of do all of that uh, reservation process. Um, of course, then there's the other side of it. This is the stuff that we don't get to see. Um, we call this the hub, uh, and it provides access to um, uh, serve users in the field. Uh, so they manage all their assets, get help with training, uh, review performance, process finances, deliver scheduled reports, create ad hoc reports, share reports, fax reports, dashboards, more reports, more. You get the idea. Um, there's a lot of data sharing and things that uh, are necessary to kind of keep everything afloat. Um, so if we do zoom in a little bit, hopefully you guys can see that. Yeah, okay. uh, the uh, program is actually pretty broad. So uh, of course, we do uh, the website. Uh, and we have um, uh, also some mobile apps for both the field and the visitors. Uh, I definitely encourage everyone to download the mobile app if you uh, are interested in kind of doing any of these recreational activities. Um, worked hard on it. And hopefully, it's, it's a good experience. Um, and then we also provide a call center uh, if you need any extra help. Uh, we support any communications or outreach uh, that any of the agency partners want to do. Uh, and we provide an open data sharing platform as well um, uh, for any of the public data that we uh, maintain. So uh, if you are interested in any of that data, you can go to ridby.recreation.gov, and um, there's APIs there to, to get all that. Um, these are the 14 participating uh, agencies. This is the latest list. Um, uh, you know, we've kind of added a, a number of agencies recently. Um, I, I won't name them all, but uh, if you're interested, you can go to rec.gov, and they're all kind of at the bottom footer there, and you can see um, all the different uh, participation. Um, so now uh, I'll take you back in time. We won't go back as far as the last talk. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll stick to maybe uh, 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, so. Uh, not long after I gave that talk in 2019, there was a little blip uh, to, uh, to everybody's travel plans and a little blip to our plans. Uh, so the pandemic took over. Uh, and as concerns for COVID grew, um, you know, just like the rest of the world, the participating agencies that you saw before, they had to take action uh, and create policies to try and keep everybody safe. Um, so we had to totally switch gears uh, and help support uh, all these new policies and initiatives um, to try and uh, keep the uh, keep everything um, from going crazy um, or as even more crazy. Um, so we went from a long list of improvements across the site to doing everything we could just to help people get the latest information about what policies are in the parks um, and in implement any new rules that uh, were coming out from the agencies that they needed to uh, push down. Um, so if you went to recreation.gov around that time, you probably saw something like this. Um, just tons of banners and warning signs scattered all throughout. Um, everywhere on the site, we tried to make it clear what the latest information was. But no doubt, it just was a confusing time for everybody. Um, 
And in April of 2020, the site, uh, right, you can kind of see the, uh, the, the blue line here is 2020, the uh, orange reddish thing is uh, 2019. Um, it's, it's way less than half of what was, is traditionally uh, the traffic on the site. Um, uh, so, you know, usually people right around April are coming out of their winter hibernation to kind of start their outdoor adventures, uh, but not this April. And uh, th um, with no clear kind of uh, end to the pandemic in sight at this point, uh, our focus became to scale the system down and, and keep the lights on. Uh, to say the least, this was not the kind of scaling challenge we had, you know, really hoped for. And then, as quickly as uh, traffic went away, uh, it came back. So May numbers were back to normal. Historical values, uh, the attitude of the team again shifted from uh, something along the lines of you know, turning things off to keeping it back on the way it was. Um, and you can kind of see the blue line here is creeping back up, up, and up um, slowly. Uh, and then after a few months, uh, we didn't just see the traffic return to normal. We saw record highs. So, uh, most days, you know, we were at least double uh, from previous highs, uh, and then sometimes we were seeing more than triple uh, of that, uh, and even higher. Um, uh, so at this point, we knew we were well past just kind of scaling a few pods up uh, to kind of keep things alive. Um, there was a ton of work to do uh, to keep the site stable uh, at the, uh, the new normal uh, at this point, uh, and even more work uh, to meet the peak demands. Um, and at this point, we were really like, hey, okay, blue line, you need to kind of calm down uh, and stop for a little bit. Um, uh, but that did not happen. Uh, it hasn't stopped at all. Um, it's really uh, just kept going up and up in terms of popularity uh, for the past few years. So these are, these are reservation numbers. Um, these aren't like just people visiting the site. These are people actually making reservations. So. Um, uh, if anyone has gone to a national park recently, you probably experienced this firsthand. Uh, they're they're busy, like super ultra busy. Uh, so, um, yeah, if you plan on going to a national park, definitely book well in advance, <coughs> um, and be prepared for long lines and crowded things. Uh, to provide some other context, here's some more numbers um, from the latest annual summary uh, that we put out. So we do about 100 million sessions. Uh, last year, um, it's close to 4 million page views. I'm sorry, 450 million uh, page views, and um, we've added about uh, 3.5 million new accounts. Um, this was like way more interest in recreation than we were ever planning for. So when we um, kind of uh, took over, we you know we architected for a certain st scale, and you know we had all the historical numbers. All this is public data, and um, you know you kind of get expected of what you would think that the site should be and how big it should be and all that kind of stuff. And this is nowhere close to uh, anything that we had uh, worked out. Uh, so um, let's get uh, some of the challenges and approaches we took to scaling the system um, to meet that demand. OK. <clears throat> so um, uh, we'll start with the architecture. Um, we knew we had some areas for improvement uh, in our architecture. Uh, this is the diagram. Uh, I showed in 2019, uh, and a lot of this is still true. Um, we still operate a microservice architecture. Uh, today we have you know, a few more services, right around 60 or 70 uh, different services. Um, they're all written in Golang. We deploy them onto uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the front end is still written in React. Uh, we host um, uh, across two AWS regions, uh, one in the East Coast, one in the West Coast. Uh, we operate that as active-active. Um, we do some uh, geolatency to get people in the right places. Um, and then uh, for data tools, you have the standard kind of set and um, Redis and um, uh, some Lucene stuff and Postgres and nothing too fancy. Um, uh, but we had to make some big changes uh, as well. Uh, so um, uh, in that 2019 talk, I talked about how we really tried to avoid any single points of failure. Uh, and we tried to operate at least three uh, of everything uh, in each region. Um, However, we kind of saw that there were a few gotchas. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities for improvement was with our firewall. Uh, so while uh, all the traffic goes to a bunch of follower nodes, and you can scale those out, and we had way more than three of those at any given time, um, those guys were all kind of 
controlled by a single node. Um, so it was a very common uh, architectural design uh, at the time. Um, and um, that controlling node was a big risk. Uh, uh, it would occasionally manifest itself in really ugly ways, and as traffic got heavier and we tried to move faster, uh, more and more we would get super undesirable behaviors out of this thing. So uh, the firewall solution um, uh, didn't, it, it just it, it had a lot of roles in the system uh, by its nature. That was kind of the, the game that security vendors at the time played. So uh, it would do egress filtering and network configurations and uh, update rule sets and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and worst of all, it would actually uh, manage some of the DNS services uh, in the VPCs. So uh, this became kind of a, a common occurrence. Um, I'm sure people are familiar with this haiku, um, but uh, this ended up in basically our Slack channels all the time and in our retrospectives. Uh, and it got to the point where, you know, basically a few wizards on the team would have to work magic all the time on the solution to keep it happy, basically had a mind of its own. It was a COTS product that had really, you know, it was limited infrastructure as code to support, so we couldn't really just, you know, blow it away when it didn't work and uh, just recreate it like we do most of the other stack. Um, and it was just a big distraction, right? Um, there was a lot of other things we needed to do besides uh, do magic on a firewall. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we were going to scale our um, uh, scale this thing and give ourselves room to focus on the things that we needed to focus on, uh, and have confidence in the platform, this thing had to go. Um, so, the other big opportunity I'll talk about for improvement was our main uh, transactional database. Uh, so, um, unlike our firewall, it did live up to our no single point of uh, failure goals, and um, it, it didn't really have any single controlling component. Uh, we had three, three nodes, uh, we had the data replicated across all three nodes, um, and it worked okay, uh, but uh, operating a dashboard, or uh, operating a distributed database for dozens of uh, unique workloads that, that were continuously scaling up and down, again, we had this microservice thing going on, and those things would go up and down all the time, because Kubernetes was really good at that, um, and people were using the site you know, pretty erratically, uh, so it was kind of hard to predict a little bit on what was happening there. Um, it was really hard. Uh, and so like adding a single node to this database was super tricky. It was time consuming. Removing one was even harder. Um, you have to do all kinds of uh, crazy dancing to get uh, uh, data replicated in um, forms and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, it basically would take half an hour or more. Pods would come up. We couldn't get the database up fast enough. And then um, you know, camping would have a bad query or something. And that would affect tickets, or would it affect some other service, right? And that is the worst situation that we strived so hard to avoid that problem where one team could affect another team's performance, um, that this was super frustrating that we ended up in this place uh, at the end of the day uh, anyway. So um, to this day, I still feel like if we put enough energy into fixing this, I think we could have. Uh, we were using a popular database. Uh, pe other people had gotten this to work. Uh, so we probably could have as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it had taken a lot of scaffolding, a lot of data architecture, um, a lot of other investments. And we basically had two choices. We either keep investing in the current stuff or, or we rip it out. And then keep, keeping them would, in my opinion, sign us up for a really long tail of additional uh, work and further potential distractions. Um, and then swapping them out had its own kind of daunting challenge of its own. Um, but ultimately, we decided to rip, replace them both with newer solutions that would give us back the focus uh, we desperately needed um, to solve the, the actual real problems of, of scaling the, everything else. Um, so, uh, you know, one reason for that is we kind of knew more about the system at that point. So we've been operating for a number of years. Uh, you know, we, we got a gist of what the baseline traffic was, how big our traffic spikes would be, what the contention on a single piece of inventory uh, would have during on sales. Um, you know, the, more specifically, you know, the reason we chose the existing database was because it had a really nice way to um, uh, manage conflicting rights uh, across regions. So, you know, if you were in New York and I was in California and we tried to make, reserve the same thing, you know, one of us has to win. Um, it's not a trivial problem. Uh, and the database had an okay solution for that, but at scale, it just kind of was falling flat. Um, and we were really nervous as things continued to grow, it would continue to struggle. Um, so we just understood more about that problem and how to solve it. And so uh, it had also been a number of years at that point, so there were a little bit more solutions out there that would fit our need. Um, so, you know, we did some research, we prototyped, we picked the next thing. Um, but the plane was kind of already in the air, so, uh, you know, we, we 
we knew how painful this would be uh, to go back and just kind of rip it all out, um, uh, especially at the same time as we were supposed to do you know, everything else that was going on. Um, but uh, as I'm sure like probably most of you can relate, it, it wasn't as painful as we thought. It was way more painful than that. Um, so uh, we m migrating the database took around a year. Um, basically, every team piled into their sprint for almost an entire year. They're, you know, they had to remodel all their data. They had to write all the migration scripts. They had to actually execute that. Um, and then you know, we, we managed to do that. We never took the site down. We never uh, interrupted anybody's vacations or anything. But you know, in order to do that while the plane's in the air, it takes a long time and really careful planning. And uh, it's a lot of work. Um, uh, the firewall is even harder to do because I've had so many different areas. So we had to get a whole bunch of different solutions and remove it. And, and basically, our platform team worked for well, well over a year, um, every sprint, slowly chipping away at this problem, uh, making progress. Um, and uh, you know, eventually, uh, over the, you know, we, we, we finally got there. And of course, we, you, know, you have to give the, uh, the click of the uh, delete the uh, stack button um, to the people who, the magicians that had to work on this thing every single day. Um, and they were super happy to finally be able to click that button. Uh, when it was all done. So, and then, you know, while some days it definitely didn't feel like it was worth it, there's no way we would be here without, uh, as my colleagues like to say, ripping the Band-Aid off of the foundational challenges. Um, and so while the new solutions come, come with their own quirks, you know, they, they accomplished their goal of basically, you know, removing a bunch of distractions and letting us uh, have a lot more confidence in, in our decisions. Um, and if you don't have that confidence, it makes every technical decision so much harder to reason about, and it creates a lot of uh, slowness throughout the organization. So those were big distractions. Um, I'll talk a little bit about little distractions as well. So here, uh, you know, basically, we used to do this thing uh, where before big releases, like Yosemite or these uh, uh, or other popular locations, we would go in and we had a calendar and we would, you know, you know basically go into Jenkins and say, OK, put the scale out for this services and make it all work. Um, and you know, basically, as we scaled up, uh, uh, or, or I should say the demand got higher, every day became some version of this problem. And we were spending tons of times trying to tweak the scale uh, to fit that day. Um, and so we uh, ultimately decided to uh, do some work uh, and get rid of this problem by, set it, by moving everything to Cato, which is an open source scheduling framework. Um, where we just have a bunch of cron jobs uh, that the developers uh, own themselves on each of the different teams. So they set these cron jobs um, well in advance. And then basically every morning, automatically we go through and we evaluate this and we scale up the cluster for that day's uh, releases. Um, and so this has saved us hundreds of hours over the course of years since we've had it, uh, and also a lot of stressful mornings where you know, maybe we might have forgotten and then uh, we have to rush and try and get, get services scaled up. Um, the other example of this, and there's lots and lots of examples of this, but I'll just give two, um, uh, was with certificate rotation. So everybody hates rotating certificates. Um, we have all of this microservice environment, so we have a certificate for each of our services. Uh, we have a certificate for each of our services for each of our environments. Uh, it's hundreds of certificates. This works great for a couple of years, because that's how long certificates are issued for. Uh, and then everything goes crazy after that. Uh, you don't remember when you're supposed to rotate them, how you're supposed to rotate them, what that service really, you know, what's going to happen if that thing fails, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, we ended up just swapping all that over uh, to a system where you can do end-to-end -end, uh, rotations of the certificates. Um, uh, and this was certainly a situation of, like, if it hurts, do it more kind of thing. So you know, now those certificates are rotated, like, every 30 days, which initially we're like, oh, that's kind of scary. But um, no, it's, it's actually been, you know, we, we, it's, we don't think about it anymore. It just happens, and we're done with it. And um, again, we now have time to go do the more important stuff. OK, so uh, at the same time, we were battling all the architecture improvements, right? Um, uh, we needed to build a ton of new features, uh, not just features for helping kind of manage all the throughput of the system, but also uh, like brand new features, because the folks in the field were requesting new ways to manage uh, the ever-growing flow of visitors. So. Um, in my 2019 talk, I talk, described this autonomous teams thing that we were doing. So basically, this, this domain that you lived in, there would be a team dedicated to that. So and, you know, as an engineer, I don't just know about going and services. I know about camping, uh, or I know about permits. And you know, we've had folks on the team that have been there since the beginning, um, where they're 
they're experts in the actual domain that they work in, not just engineering. And that was, that's always the idea. That was the whole point of doing that. Um, the problem is that like, you, you just, you know, have, you only have so many of these people. So uh, as you scale up the team, right, you don't want to kind of lose all that. And so you end up having this kind of like really shallow uh, bench, so to speak, uh, of folks. So, uh, and then the other thing that happens is a lot of these services became super, um, uh, super specific to their particular problems. Uh, and so these engineers would, you know, they, we gave them a lot of autonomy to do whatever they needed to for that particular problem. And so the services ended up being very different from one another. Um, and so it was really hard for somebody from one service to jump into another service because they had to re kind of relearn everything about how that service operated. Um, and so there were just a number of problems on how we would scale this up. Uh, we didn't want single points of failures for people. Uh, and we wanted this to be a lot more efficient at saying, hey, well, we already have that. But like, I'm not going to rebuild that. I'm just going to take parts of this and parts of this and parts of this, and then uh, you know, we can just move away faster than that. So we have, we can have 60 or 70 of these services. There's probably nothing, you know, you'd have to get super creative before we probably don't have 80% of the solution to a problem. Um, so how do we build this consistency? Um, well, uh, so one example I'll tell you is, uh, you know, we, we have a ton of rate limiting throughout the solution now. Um, so, you know, if you get stuck on, what, what you might have seen if you tried to book Yosemite or something like that is you click the button and it tells you, hey, there's an error, there's too many people, try again. Right, well, you know, that's not a great experience. So basically what we do now is we have a modal panel that comes through and if you ever get tagged up in that situation, it'll retry for you. It gives you a much better opportunity of getting the, uh, the, uh, the specific sites that you want at specific dates, which is really cool. But we don't want to have to redo that experience for every different inventory that we maintain, right? Camping, tickets, permit, they all have these kinds of scan the same kinds of problems. And so we want one team to solve it and then everybody gets to all that benefit, right? And so. Um, we do this for every UI aspect of the system. So we have a design system uh, that we publish, and um, there's a website that we host uh, that, you know, it's kind of a style guide where everybody can go check it out and uh, kind of evaluate what's already there uh, before they make any new UI whatsoever. Um, you know, of course, if there is a UI that they need to make, then we'll, they're free to do that. But um, uh, basically, uh, we, we want them to use that. Uh, the other part of this, so that's the front end on the back end, um, I'm going to move a lot quicker, sorry, it's taking too long, uh, is uh, uh, we basically have a shared uh, SDK where um, we, can, we kind of provide similar interfaces for all the services. So uh, they all use the same kind of logging structure. We all do caching the same way. We retrieve secrets the same way. We talk to SQS. We do recapture the same way, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll skip over this, but you get the gist. We're, we do want to do uh, an IDP. We're kind of getting into that. So I talked to you a lot about how, like, uh, how, how am I as a developer supposed to know what the other 60 services are supposed to be doing or how, how to operate them. Um, like, the IDPs are a really promising way to kind of solve that problem and get a lot more efficiencies and standardization across all the different services. Uh, so we're super interested in kind of this approach. We're kind of jumping into it. This is a, a current version of it uh, where today you can kind of go to any, any of our services. Uh, and you'll say, who, who owns that service? What are the APIs it offers? What are the relationship to other services it has, um, et cetera? So you know, in theory, we can kind of expand this out to all kinds of things around how do you operate it, how do we create new services, et cetera, et cetera. So, OK. So um, let me shift over to deployments. So uh, I talked about uh, in 2019 that we did a, you know, we're, we're, we're around 1,000 production builds a year. I think we've hit closer to two to 3,000 at some point uh, along this. Um, and we've been able to maintain that cadence uh, throughout the whole process. Um, however, in order to maintain that cadence, uh, we needed to do some tweaks, right? So previously, tech leads were given the responsibility of releasing new functionality when they uh, saw that, you know, there was sufficient technical risk reduction and all that, and they coordinated with the agency stakeholders. Uh, to confirm any functionality was appropriate, then they would release, and what releasing was was just going to Jenkins and pressing the deploy button. Um, however, uh, the, the environment was kind of totally rapidly shifting all around us, and the number of stakeholders grew. Uh, it was really complicated to try and time the deployments. Um, so, you know, you know, when they, you would, you would want to release this, and then may, oh, maybe the policies change, so you take it back, and that kind of stuff. Um, so we do trunk-based deployments. Or sorry, we do trunk-based development, right? So um, people are constantly pushing code into that thing. It's really annoying if you have to kind of back that up, and it creates a lot of risk in the rest of the process. Uh, so you know, you, your, your builds get bigger, you release bigger code, you have more opportunities for failures. So um, that wasn't a great place to be. So uh, we really 
uh, wanted to separate the releases from deployments. Um, and then so we, we went to feature flags pretty quickly. Uh, you know, we, uh, we didn't want to build something ourselves, so uh, we kind of found somebody to help us uh, implement that and get, uh, you know, basically everybody bought into the system of feature flagging. Um, it, it's, it's a new tool. It, it did not kind of like just work right out of the box. It took a long time, I think, for teams to kind of understand how to leverage these things uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, but um, mm, you can kind of like, it, it, it took a while, but um, uh, eventually what ended up happening was uh, basically we started integrating feature flags into the actual development cycle itself. So when we built a feature and we designed it, we architected it, we would, uh, teams would just naturally say like, okay, I'm going to build it this way so I can talk it off or I can do the experiment this way and I'm going to build this part first. And, um, you know, it, it, you kind of got into that mindset. Um, so here you can see basically the, the most simplest version of this. This is what we did really early on, which is basically like, okay, uh, I'm gonna, we can keep the policies on or we can turn them off, right? And we don't need to do a whole bunch of deployments. We don't have to do uh, a bunch of complicated stuff. They're either on or off, depending on the policy of the day, right? And that was super nice. Uh, then we got into this like, kind of other approach where we could actually create mini CMSs. Um, where you know, if there was an important public notification, we could quickly go and say, okay, this is what needs to go out. Again, no deployments. We don't have to do a whole bunch of backend code to build a approval functionality and all this kind of stuff that we would have needed to do if this was part of the uh, solution itself. Um, so uh, just, uh, just another way to fit, save a lot of efficiencies in the process. Um, and then this uh, is a page that you guys don't have access to. If you go to rec.gov right now, uh, you won't see this. I, I do, uh, because I, I asked for permission to see it, because I needed to do this demo. Um, and then, uh, uh, basically, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the whole release process, and hopefully this will be out soon if anybody's interested in uh, translation on the site. Um, so that, that picker menu is uh, located in the header bar, right? And that header, again, is part of that shared UI. So um, what we do is we have a, a, a React um, a micro page architecture. Or that we call the you know, micro front end kind of approach kind of thing. Um, so that means that you know, once we update that header, right, we have to have all these services integrate that code and then deploy that up to production. Well, that, that means that you could have state that's kind of totally out of whack. You go to some pages, you wouldn't see the header, or you see a different version of the header and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you put it behind a feature flag, you can wait a week or two while everybody gets their code up. Uh, and then when you can turn it on, you get a consistent experience across the entire site. Everybody has the same version of that particular component. Um, super, super nice. Uh, and then probably more importantly, if there was something wrong, you don't have to do 60 different deploys to turn it off. You just turn the button off and then it goes away. Um, so that was, a, that was kind of a non-obvious, uh, really nice approach to the feature flagging thing. Um, and of course, what we do is we don't just turn it on. Uh, we actually uh, will open it up to only the stakeholders that need to. So for this particular piece of functionality, um, how, how much time do I have? Two more minutes? Okay, I was, I was making sure it's accurate. Okay. Uh, yeah, so then um, uh, we uh, can give it to folks like me that need to do the demo, uh, the engineering team, the QA team, mini media or communications that need to go out, any of the agency stakeholders that want to see it. They can all see this in production uh, the, way, um, the way it will be as soon as it turns on. Um, and then from there, we'll take about three weeks. We'll go to 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100% traffic look at the metrics, make sure we're all in good shape, um, get customer feedback, all that kind of stuff before we release it all. Um, okay. Probably most importantly, if we, we use this to say, to do, to do experiments, and so part of scaling challenges is to not do stuff. Um, we had one thing in here where basically we had a little countdown clock and we'd say like, hey, the next event is at this time. Well, we did a bunch of experimentation around that clock. It was useless. Nobody paid attention to it. It didn't help anything, so we deleted it, right? Uh, all these things have a ton of maintenance tails against them, so we're super aggressive. If we don't see anything that's, that's not working or it's not accomplishing the goal, we get rid of it um, pretty quickly. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and tie all this up. Um, There's kind of a whirlwind of different stories and kind of random things um, about you know, our approaches to scaling different parts of the problem, but uh, when five million extra people basically show up to the party, uh, everybody wants to try and help, right? Uh, the platform team wanted to blow the whole thing up and start over. That's what platform teams do. Um, uh, the devs wanted to try, you know, the latest, coolest language. Sorry, we weren't going to 
do Rust and move the whole thing to you know different thing. Product wanted to release new features yesterday, then never, then two weeks, then tomorrow. You get the idea. And then definitely nobody wanted to do any more uh, rotating of certificates. Um, but and they're all right, right? The, um, you should do all those things, but you can't do everything. Um, so we just had to find a way to do as much of it as we could, as efficiently as we could. Um, so we had to look at every aspect of our engineering process to find efficiencies and claw back as much time as we could to do more. It's more of everything. Uh, and to me, this is uh, uh, probably a lot of folks in this room, that's really the spirit of DevOps. It's, it's more than just a faster pipeline or a shorter incident response time. It's about optimizing the system as a whole and not getting locked into any you know, uh, local maxima. Uh, right? um, so if, if we were to have stopped everything and done no more releases just to change the database, there'd be a whole lot of angry people. Uh, or if we were to just release a ton of new features on top of a shaky firewall, we'd probably still end up with a whole lot of angry people. Uh, so we did our best to find ways to work on everything all at once, uh, and we plan on continuing to do so and continuing to find efficiencies in every last aspect of the, of the software, of, of our software development lifecycle to, um, uh, to do that. Uh, in particular, we, you know, the more efficient we can be, that we can, the more efficient we can do, we can focus on the stuff that really matters, um, most importantly, like spending time outside. So thank you. <laughs>